You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome back to the Apple Insider Podcast with me, Victor, and William Apple. I see what you did there. I'm not going to say that I liked it, but I, I didn't dislike it. Reminds me of Johnny Appleseed, which uh, isn't a terribly well-known story in the UK. And I've just kind of vaguely heard the name. He planted some trees, and I presume they were apple trees. And this is the story. But, you know, it's as a piece of historical callback. I'll take that. Yeah. Very good. Should I call you Victor Apple? I'm, not, I'm suddenly not sure what the polite thing to do is. I'm not sure either. Okay. That, that would imply that we're brothers. And while I certainly feel that sort of familial, that, that fraternal relationship with you, I don't know that that would work. Okay. You're happy to extend the, 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 the <laughs> nice part, but strictly clear designs, clear links, clear divisions for any legal issues that might ensue. Okay. Thanks. Well, given the amount of trouble you get into, absolutely. I wish you were kidding about that. Yes. All right. <laughs> And she thought you were. When you call from the precinct, <laughs> I will answer. <laughs> right. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to ask how you are, but I, I think I can tell. Uh, and I'm fine too, <laughs> mostly. So Good, good. What's, what's happening? What's going on? Well, in, in the past, you and I spoke about Wistron and about the Indian market. And we were talking about that in times about how – India is is kind of a, an interesting trouble spot for Apple where they keep trying to sell phones, but their phones are very expensive. And so they can either sell the old phone like the SE, but it's old and people recognize that it's old, or they can sell new phones that are too expensive for that market. Yes. But, I mean, they and, could and make one of the cheaper other th phones, but we're talking about Apple. So you're right. That's Well, right. and and there are compromises, right? When you start making a cheaper phone, you're giving up on something. Mm -hmm. And Apple doesn't really like to give up on something. I'm not. I'm not going to characterize the whole country, but I'd say that historically there is a sense that that negotiation is appropriate in many settings in India, and and this, this is changing a little bit. But of course, Apple is coming from the traditional perspective as far as they're going. They know this is a firm sale, and it's this price. Now, Wistron has has been known for their production of low cost mo models that were for sale in India in the past. They built the iPhone SE and the success for the local market, and they built them in India so they would save on import costs. The company has increased their investment in India. Back in January, we heard that they were doing 30 billion rupees in additional investment in the region. Uh, we don't even know exactly how that's going to be used, but it, it looks as if all of this could be so that Apple could go ahead and, and shift production of the iPhone to India to reduce dependence on China. It's one of the few options available to, to Foxconn to move into, who's also said to be looking to production in Vietnam. So... Doing that kind of thing would, would also reduce costs further for iPhone sales in India. So Wistron's current production capacity isn't enough to cover the consumer demand in India. They're really relying on imports to make up the bulk of the purchases in the market. So Wistron increasing their investment in the area, Foxconn looking at it as a place to expand, all are good news for India and also good news for Apple not having to pay import taxes if they can produce the devices in country. All follows. Makes absolute sense. Let's do that. Yes. And, you know, if the uh, if the U.S.-China trade war continues, then that also makes good sense. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think in a similar way, we ought to think Brexit may have come up once or twice. We have a lot of things where companies are just leaving the UK. Even if Brexit suddenly reversed and didn't happen, I don't think those companies are going to move back. They've spent their money, they've gone. I think as we're seeing all these companies move around, even if the U.S.-China tariff war business calms down i think they're going to stay spread around wherever they are it just doesn't seem economically sensible to do it otherwise does it creating instability creating a, a, a situation of economic fear has results right it has real costs and you're, you're absolutely right i think when you when you uh inspire a company to seek headquarters elsewhere that you, you you'd have to do a lot to create an incentive for them to come back yeah. but in this case i mean uh, it's bad in brexit as far as apple and production are concerned it all sounds good to me anything that makes something locally has got to be great so actually yay for all of this no yeah cool all right then yeah why not so you know you have accused me in the past rather of caring <laughs> about 
health and and caring about health monitoring accused um i think i've correctly identified that's i'll go as far as that <laughs> i'm not disinterested in health but you you've got a long track record of really following all the details so i find it fascinating when you know there's a tiny uh, health story but you know why it's important i love this stuff so what's happened healthily this week well so there are signs that say that the the future macbook models could offer some of the same health and fitness tracking functions that the apple watch provides that you, they could place a, a biosensor in the case near the trackpad that the user could access while typing on the keyboard. And uh. it, just thinking about it, I mean, this comes from a patent application. And we know that patent applications may or may not turn into things that are actual products. But thinking about it, it makes sense. Many people who use their laptops do so well seated. Would you agree? Yes. Okay. And sitting is not exactly the healthiest thing for a person. It's pretty good, but I guess, okay. Yes. Well, I mean, it's comfortable, but it's, it's in terms of health-wise, you're meant to be up and moving. And, you know, one of the things the Apple Watch does is tell you periodically that you need to go and have some activity, that you need to get up and move, right? Yeah. And so they could embed a sensor that goes ahead and makes contact with your wrist as you're typing and catches your, your heart rate from the palm rest. Oh, I see. Sorry. I was thinking, what, what is it going to do? Monitor how fast I'm typing. But you mean the actual palm rests would make the same connection that the back of my watch does? Okay, suddenly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you'd be able to detect the heart rate, the respiration rate, the uh, the, the pulse oxygen level, the uh, blood pressure, and blood volume. And, and the typing speed. Okay. Well, that's, that's already easy to detect. But, you know, you could... To be able to detect the the water content in the user, so you know you, you can grab a lot of different measurements out of this. And obviously, if you're seated and working, and that's bad for your health, then we can see these measurements, and it can you know tell you get up and be active because, and you know it can tell you the kinds of things that the watch tells you. Right, I have to. Did you really just say detect the water content? In me. Yeah, that's one of the things you can do. If you have an infrared LED light source, you can detect water content in the user, which allows you to increase the number of other things you can measure based on that. Okay, I'm agog at the Are you scared? Things. You're a little scared, huh? I, I, safest thing is to say yes. It's a more complex answer than that. <laughs> but yes, okay, all right. I mean, that's astounding that you can do that. I take it well, I'm just that's just you to me. I haven't heard that before. Has it been around for a while or something? But it, well, some of this has. But the the idea is that putting this in a laptop where you're sitting and typing for long periods of times, putting the palm rest is a good idea hmm. because you're using it and you're in contact for a long period of time. You know, the other place that they're putting health related sensors is uh, potentially in the second generation of AirPods. Oh, yes, that's true. I've written about that. That makes sense as well. I could see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they're certainly not the first to put that kind of thing in in a wireless headphone. Uh, Broggy, a couple of years ago, put Pulse in that, and LG did it in a wired headset. And it makes sense because if you're actually out there using them for fitness, well, you don't want to have to, to have it attached anywhere else. You've already got them in your ears. They're already making contact. Why not? Mm. So the, I, I think the thing here is that it's about making health more holistic, making it be a part of everything. And that's that's a good thing. But if this means uh, already the watch does a lot, and uh, I don't know how much the iPhone does. It obviously records all this data. The MacBook could do all these things. Uh, is that me? leave the Mac out? No health benefits on the Mac at all? Well, the MacBook is a Mac. True. Okay. Mac Mini then. The um the legendary uh, Mac Pro. Yes, the Mac, the Mac Mini, and the iMac Pro, and those things would be left out probably. I'm yeah. looking for more reasons to buy an iMac. You see, and you're not really helping me. Yeah. No, I'm not. Apple, you know, is is looking to increase their exposure in the health platform. Right? They have they have over 50 medical doctors spread throughout the company. They're building these these they've got these health labs. This is an area that's not going away for Apple. They are clearly invested in this. Yes, I'm surprised this week we heard there's the new website that they own called Privacy is Important. I would have expected being healthy is quite important too, dot com could have been in there as well. Yeah. Those seem to be the two thrusts of this of this technology company, security and health are in there. Yeah. But you know, I like both of these things. Absolutely. Yeah. I do too. Now of course as we're talking about new MacBooks, one of the things we ought to talk about is the idea of an ARM based MacBook. Really? Has that come around again, do you think? 
Every few years, don't I we think hear so. that? Is it now looking we do. a bit more like? Yes, it's now looking a bit more likely because I remember hearing some story that uh, somebody in Intel told a client that it was going to happen. So if Intel thinks it's happening, uh, is that the story here that it's even more that is, likely? As that well? is the one. I don't know the details though of who was saying it and how disappointed they sounded. So yeah, it's it's been rumored and. I, I'm hopeful because I think it's a very interesting development, and I imagine it puts fear into the heart of Intel. Yes, I would imagine so. I, I, I'm interested in so many things because uh, there's obviously the technology, which I think you would understand more than I do. There's the programming side, which I have some experience of, but also I just remember the whole business of moving uh, from 68,000 years into the Power PC and then Power PC into Intel. I, given how other companies go to lengths to avoid this kind of move. Apple's, you know, getting a bit twitchy about this. Done it before, do it again. Yeah, it'd be fun to see what happens. Well, the the Power C, Power PC move was a really risky one. Was that the because first? Because that operating system yeah. was not, well, it was not really portable as an operating system goes. And it was very, very difficult to make that leap. Uh that was the one that happened just as the company was on its last legs. Then Steve Jobs had come in, and it it was one that was barely pulled off. The move to Intel was significantly easier because Next, which started on 68K, was able to run on Intel. They'd already done that work. Oh, I see. Right. I, this is I, oh, let's test your knowledge of Mac hardware. One of my absolute favorite Macs to ever work on uh, was one of the very first PowerPC ones. And it was a quite a quadro like flat box. Uh, and the monitor had speakers built in at an angle for it. It was just, I was in an office with a load of PCs and there was my Mac. It looked great. And I loved it. And I loved it so much. I can't remember the name of it. Can you pause like, like an 8100 AV or something like that? Or a, I don't know. Or a 7600 yeah, Power Mac. Yeah, I was kind of hoping or... a bell would ring when you said something like that, but it hasn't oh. yet. Oh, well. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. Yeah, keep talking. We're both going to look this up, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> At least I'll recognize it when I see it, hopefully. What was your uh, favorite Mac from the PowerPC? Like, I can't believe I just said that. But okay, do you have one? You are ridiculous. You know that, right? Yes. Oh, I think it might be a 6100. Power Macintosh okay. 6100. I've got a picture of that that looks like the thing I'm thinking of. I remember the keyboard was great as well. I really like that keyboard. Yeah. I mean, the LC520 was kind of an unusual looking one. But that was, again, a 68K, not a Power Mac. Right. Well, me and 68K, we don't talk anymore. No. That's That's a nice little diversion. But you were mentioning privacy 10 seconds ago. Yes, it's constantly on my mind. About every 10 seconds, I think about it. Uh, is there something on your mind every 10 seconds as well? That sounded well, wrong. So, okay. so I want to tell you, we've had privacy come up in recent weeks, and there was a, a Facebook story that I'm going to tell you about really quickly. Mm -hmm. So Zuck, Mark Zuckerberg, is embarking on a privacy-focused roadmap. They are shifting away from the public focus that have landed them in multiple scandals, he said. Public social networks will continue to be very important in people's lives for connecting with everyone you know, discovering new people, ideas, and content, and giving people a voice more broadly. People find these valuable every day, and there are still a lot of useful services to build on top of them. But now, with all the ways people also want to interact privately, there's also an opportunity to build a simpler platform that's focused on privacy first. And that they will increasingly shift to private encrypted services where people can be confident that what they say together to each other, stay secure, and their messages and content won't stick around forever. Okay, well, you called him Zuck. You're on first syllable terms with him, and I'm not that clear. This sounds like everything he's said several times before, and the uh, undertow of it is that everything now isn't in any way secure, private, yeah. encrypted. Yeah. Well, and WhatsApp sort of is. Instagram is not. Facebook is not. And what they're going to do is they're going to make all of these services integrate with each other and talk to each other. And you have to actually opt out to uh, avoid having them talk to each other. 
Okay. I'm wondering how many people out there in the real world know that Facebook owns uh, either of those for it. I mean, I didn't until... Probably, uh, yeah. yeah. Until you, actually. <laughs> I think you told me about it. And I, I remember gasping, but I do that from time to time. Yeah. Well, so the, the thing is, is that it wasn't that long ago you and I were talking about how Facebook had a data harvesting VPN app yes. that had broken Apple's enterprise rules. Ah, that small thing. Ah, yes, close down all their software for a bit. Yes, yes. But they've learned their lessons now. Have they? Again, yes. I don't know how we'll know uh, that they've learned it until it goes wrong again sometime. But mm. So what makes a data breach the worst breach of all time? The worst of all time. What to you would make the, a data breach the worst data breach of all time. Uh, if somebody could see my reading history in the Apple bookstore, my Netflix queue, uh, some of my Apple Music favorite playlists I'd be embarrassed about. Uh, oh, uh, I suppose, you know, bank details. Although, if you're going to clean somebody out, you're not going to start with my bank account, are you? So what about you? Yeah. Is there something more? Well, in in America, we have something called a social security number. Oh, of course you do, Which yes. is... It, is issued by the government. You're, you have a government ID, don't you? We have a government somewhere. Yes, uh, we have tax ID codes and things like that. They're nowhere near right, as right. common and, and, uh, commonly needed as and, yours. And you yeah. have you have NHS records, right? You have National Health Service records. Yes. Okay. Now, losing one of those would be bad, right? Uh, I certainly see in the States that would be a, a big thing. Here, it would be inconvenient, but seriously, the number of times we have to use a national insurance number, as it's called, uh, Hardly that matter. So, yeah, I wouldn't notice right. for quite so, a while. This is the problem. The, the social security number ends up being used as an ID number for a lot of things, and it gets tied to our credit reports and our credit history. And so, mm. it's um, you know one of the ways that that when you apply to purchase something, they check your credit, or when you apply for a job, they check your credit to see if you're responsible enough to be an employee, or see if you're responsible enough to to purchase the thing you're trying to purchase. Sure. Right, okay. and if you have bad credit, then you may not get hired over someone who does have good credit. Right? Never thought about it from the employment side, but that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Uh, mm. It's it's really frustrating. It's difficult because if you're trying to get back on your feet, you can't get employment to get back on your feet. It's a social problem. Right. Now, uh, to that end, there are credit agencies in the U.S. There's there's Equifax and some of these others, right? Mm -hmm. And they maintain the credit reports. And when someone runs your credit, they run it with one of those agencies. And, and you know, you're, you're entitled in the U.S. to run your credit with all of them once a year so you can make sure that what they have on you is correct. Okay. Yes. Similar thing here. Yeah. Okay. So losing a social security number would be bad. Losing 145 million of them would be very bad. Did you look where you last put them? No, I can't find them. So Breach is a podcast that takes you inside the world's biggest hacks, how they're done, who does them, and what's really at stake when your private data is compromised. And this season, they're investigating the worst breach ever by Equifax. And so if you wanted to, you could listen to season two of Breach, the Equifax story. This time it's personal. Subscribe to Breach. That's B-R-E-A-C-H in your podcast app right now. I, I, I'm going to do that because I think it's really interesting to hear what they find out about it. I, I I am very skeptical of the credit reporting agencies. I'm kind of surprised that they haven't been replaced already by someone with a blockchain. It's, but <laughs> Sorry, I'm just typing I mean, in the, Breach Podcast into my browser to make sure I've got it. There, there it is. Oh, I'm having that. Okay. Um, yes, I understand. Okay. Uh, but you're not going to tell me anything more about the 149 million, whatever it was. Well, I mean, this was the last... Last year, they, they were exposed as having let out 145 million social security numbers. They were breached. And it was, it was a little more complicated than that because it appeared as if there were people that were aware of it bef when it happened that, and they didn't release it until much later. And so they were selling stock and things like that based on this infinite information. Oh, okay. That's different. Wow. Okay. Right. It's, it's bad every which way, coming and going. Yes. Right. Well, don't do that then. Don't lose all of them. Okay? Right. No, don't, don't lose all of them. So yeah, it's it's really problematic. And 
you know, what we do over here is we end up trying to place freezes on the credits so that people can't add things to them. Yeah, I've heard that here too. Yes, but it's uh, only as effective as as it can be. Right. Sorry, my mind. Well, it's really nightmarish is, yeah. because you know you're you're applying for a job, let's say again, and they want to do a credit run on you and. They don't tell you which agency they're going to pull from. And so you've got freezes at four agencies and they're like, yeah, we can't run your credit. You can't be hired. Hmm. And, you know, sometimes they'll tell you that and sometimes they just won't and they won't hire you. So you have to preemptively figure out which agency they're going to use and unfreeze it just for that one or unfreeze all of them and be vulnerable during that time when you're trying to be hired. Right. I it's don't know how you can really figure obnoxious. out which one they'll use. Well, in in – you know, in my example, um, they really wanted to make the hire. And so they tried three times. And on the fourth one, we unfroze the right account. Oh, okay. Right. That's, but if, they've got to want But you. if there were other, yeah. exactly. Had there been other candidates that were just as strong, that would have been it. Yeah. Well, what a world we live in. Okay. Um, I hope you, whoever it's, it was, got whatever it was they were after. And that all's fine now. Can you just tell me that? All's fine now? William Apple, all is fine now. Okay, let's not make that a thing. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right, all right. Now, speaking about credit reporting and governments and things like that, so Huawei is suing the U.S. government. They have filed a lawsuit. <laughs> as you do. Let's sue the entire government. As, as, yeah. as one does. Well, no, so that's the th suing the federal government is not that unusual. You you tend to sue, um, you know, you sue sue the government or you sue the attorney general because they're acting on behalf of the government or something like. That. So you'll read cases where where it says you know uh, the the party filing the lawsuit versus the um, the person who happens to be the attorney general at the time, head of the justice department. It's fairly common. That's that part's not that unusual. How common is uh, winning? That's difficult. It happens. I don't know that it happens quite a lot. You know, we could have uh, we could have one of my attorney friends, uh, T. Greg Dissett, who's been on this podcast before, come on and talk about that if we wanted to. Okay, I'm I'm just curious to know because okay, but uh, what's making you say this now? What's been happening? Well, so Huawei filed a lawsuit because they are not pleased with the U.S. government's purchasing ban on Huawei equipment. Oh yes. Okay. So as a part of 2018's National Defense Authorization Act, which is a bill that goes through Congress pretty much every year, it authorizes national defense and then funding for it. Uh, they sometimes write in different requirements and different things in there. And this this last year's got the notion that that they would limit government agency spending on certain products. They prohibited certain telecommunications and video surveillance services, which restrict government agencies from purchasing equipment manufactured by Huawei and ZTE. And Huawei is saying that's unconstitutional. That it is a, a bill of attainder, which is a legal term that says it's a legislative act that declares a person or persons guilty of an act and punishes them without due process. Okay. What are the odds of success? Well, they're going to have to find a sympathetic court and they're going to have to present evidence. And what the, the first question is, is this a, an act that declares them guilty of anything and punishes them without due process? So what, what are they being accused of being guilty of? And then they're going to have to talk about that. The, the, what they're saying is that Congress has repeatedly failed to produce any evidence to support their restrictions on Huawei products. Right. What else is going on here? I mean, uh, if the odds of success well, are not great, what's the benefit to them of making this suit? For, first of all, they're local heroes. Ah. In, in China, they're heroes. And adding to that is that their CFO, Wang Zhu Meng, yeah. is fighting extradition um, from Canada to, to the US, right? They're, they have charges for bank fraud, wire fraud, and violations of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act and conspiracy to commit money laundering. Oh, these small things. God, people are so fuzzy. So yes. yeah. it's um, it's part yeah. of the bigger fight is really what you're telling me. 
I, uh, well, multiple fronts, I would say. Multiple good phrase. Now, hmm. in addition to that, there, you know, there's there's also prosecution alleged that Huawei conducted business operations in Iran through one of their um, affiliates, Skycom, in violation of U.S. sanctions on Iran, and then lied about partnerships and banking tied to that. There are also charges that Huawei personnel stole trade secrets relating to a T-Mobile robot called Tappy. Sorry, a T-Mobile robot called Tappy. Yes. And they stole trade secrets about the robot. It was a secret, but it isn't now. Well, how the robot was made, things like that, they stole it. Oh, right. They stole the secrets. I might have. Or at least, let's be very clear, they're alleged to have stolen the secrets. Good point. Well caught. I'm just thinking I would have kept the name a big secret as well if it was Tappy. But, okay. That's well, just... but that's T-Mobile, not, not yeah. Huawei doing it. Yeah. Okay. So... So basically, Huawei is being uh, quite busy these days. What with that and the foldable phones, their lawyers are going to do great. <laughs> right. <laughs> I actually, I mean, I know this is slightly off topic, but having said foldable phones to you, uh, having not seen either in the flesh, I like the look mm-hmm. of Huawei's one better than I do the Samsung one. But uh, there's a story this week on Apple Insider that actually I was involved in um, to do with Corning uh, saying that they're working on foldable glass. And there's this little image of glass that they've bent. And it's just astounding that it can spring back again, but it's still glass compared to the plastic or polymers. I, I have seen flexible glass in the past, right? I've seen this as a part of screen protectors where the demonstration was a, a glass screen protector suspended at either end and a piston pushing on into the center and showing the deflection. And you could get a good two inches of deflection before it broke. Okay. Which is an astounding amount. It's a huge amount. More than I would have imagined. But uh, is that the same as... But it's not folding in that's... half. No, it's not the same. Okay. Do you think this foldable stuff is just an expensive fad or what's going to happen next? But you, you have to think about use case, yeah. right? The, 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 there are a couple of difficulties. The, f- the phone form factor fits in our pockets, mostly. The form, phone form factor is reachable by our hands, mostly. Yeah. But there are times where we crave larger screens, clearly. And so having a phone that collapses into being the form factor that fits in the pocket, mostly, and is reachable by our hands, mostly, but then can come out and expand into being something that's suitable for our eyes, is, is an interesting idea presuming that that's what we really need, if that's the content we need, if that's the size that we need. I just kind of fancy one. Let's be absolutely clear about this. Um, well, the, the biggest factors besides does it actually work are, is there content for it? And is the operating system going to account for it, right? Mm. If, if you've got an operating system that accounts for it, but none of the apps are aware of it, then it's junk. If you've got an operating system that is aware of it, but doesn't handle it well, it's junk. There, there are a lot of things that have to come together for it to be useful. Really, then, by the sound of it, what I'm waiting for is Apple to do it. Uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, I don't know what they'll do. Uh, Corning is interesting because Apple uses them all the time. So Corning actually says they have shown foldable samples to companies. One imagines that must include Apple. Um uh, and if it is a glass case, uh, I, I believe glass is better than the plastic polymers. That's fine. But when you say that about operating system and apps, you know if Apple does this, it'll do it completely. There won't be apps. Well, no, that don't no, make no. Yeah. There will be plenty of apps that straggle. Now, Apple's apps will get on board, but you know, getting app developers on board means that they'll be hit or miss. That some of them will be available on launch day, and some will straggle, and some won't ever update at all. I'm okay with that. I think, yeah. As long as the I hooks mean, there are was there for them to do it. There, there was a story I was reading last week or this week. I was reading this week about people who wanted to fund a Kickstarter to create a fund to pay developers of classic iOS games to update their apps so they would continue to run. Actually, can I stop you there? Because I wrote a story about that and I was talking with their PR people. Although that's exactly how I heard it, that they were trying to get development to fund that. What they now say is actually no. They're self-funding. They're doing it themselves. What they want is to get the source code for these uh, games and themselves develop them and then get them. I think, I mean, good luck to them. That's slightly cheekier. That's not exactly the 
holistic story I'd heard. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's an absolutely great idea. But until they tell us all the details, I, I'm, I'm really curious to know how it shakes out. Uh, who gives you the source code? Who profits from any sales afterwards? Who has the rights? I think they're underestimating the work and overestimating the demand. So we'll see. But I, I love the idea. So yeah. fingers crossed for them. Yeah. Well, so there's, I mean, it's important that classic games don't die. And and this is part of, you know, the uh, archive.org, the Internet Archive's mission is, is besides preserving websites, they also have an archive of classic games hmm. from many different computer systems. And, it, you know, people say games, come on, why bother? But I think there's an artistry to them that that in terms of story, in terms of user engagement, in terms of pushing the limits of what systems were capable of at the time with 8-bit graphics and 8-bit music – and that that art should not be lost. I think whatever gamers use now is what the rest of us come to use later. So I'm interested for that. So as a, a writer, I'm also I know people who write video games, and they are so interesting about it. But as it turns out, I just personally am not much of a gamer. Are you? Um, off and on, I I have at different points throughout my life been heavily into it and then backed out, and. But but I, I think that it really is an art form. I, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And whether or not it appeals to you or engages you or captures your imagination and time is is down to a matter of taste and what you're willing to invest in in terms of time. Sure. You know, you might not be the person that says you're going to go and invest two hours listening to opera at a performance. You're not going to read the operetta and you're not going to study the singers. But other people do. It doesn't make the art form any less valid. Oh, yes, totally. Absolutely. So uh, preservation. Uh, I'm Absolutely. Really in for that. Although it just occurs to me, I've noticed I have one game on my iPhone. It's Sudoku, uh, a Sudoku app. It's on my iPhone. It's on my iPad. I play it quite a lot, but that's it. Um, yeah. That's the, You've gone off Angry Birds then. Yeah, you never quite got <laughs> into that. Uh, yeah, the second oh, movie. Poor just, Angry Birds. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, but speaking about this, you know, one of the things to think about is where do these developers come from, right? The, we've got we've got people who've been making games for years, but what inspires new people to do that? Well, Tim Cook was at the White House and was talking about how coding and education is is pretty much tantamount to student success. That they believe that it's a requirement in the U.S. for every kid to have a coding before they graduate from from their uh, uh, primary and secondary school and be somewhat proficient at it. So they've got this SWIFT curriculum and they've distributed it to all the schools in the U.S. and 4,000 have picked it up. Now, there are obviously a lot more than 4,000 schools in the U.S., but they've done that and they've done that with 80 community colleges and they are pushing coding. They are pushing SWIFT programming. And... That's that's kind of a big deal, I think. You know, it's it. I, I want to address this a little bit, right? There's there are people that say everyone can code or everyone should code, and you know, it's it's not exactly accurate. Yes, people can. Yes, it should. People should have some proficiency in it, just so we understand how things work, and and that people should be able to find whether or not it's something that they that appeals to them. But from time to time, you know, there are these journalism layoffs. You see people pile on as trolls and saying, well, they should go learn to code. Yes. As if journalism was a worthless pursuit, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's one of those things where it, it it's not a um, – that it, it is, it's a valid skill, that coding is a valid skill. It's a necessary kind of skill to be at least familiar with even if you don't pursue it as a career. Uh, I am actually in favor of what Apple's doing here. I mean, like it matters whether I am or not. But uh, – I have certain problems with the whole thing because of two things. I think are more British problems than worldwide. There has been a fashion here for a few years for uh, the government to say children must be able to code. They must be able to code. They've got to have it. And then you ask one of the MPs here, so what is coding? And they fall apart. They don't know. It's a yeah. great buzzword to do it. And then I'm afraid the other thing is I was in, I work a lot in schools and one of them showed me an example of their coding. And it is nothing like coding at all it is a graphical system of moving two blocks together and you know that's it that's that's called mit scratch language and it is coding 
Okay, I'm not incorrect because I was there and I saw it, and it was certainly <laughs> not MIT level. And I don't mean I mean literally dragging one square next to another and telling yes, me yes, that's coding that blocks. Made, no, there that's was coding. no blocks in there. It was a block of color on a screen. They made a little yes. image and told me that yes. that was a code, but it isn't. No, what does this code do? It is. A red block and a blue well, block. Well, the different colored blocks, the different blocks do different functions. Some of them are repeat blocks. Some of right. them are subroutine blocks. No. Some of them I knew are. This is where you these were are going. the no. It and is these none of are that. the building blocks of programming. And actually, there are production systems that are programmed in this way. You are being very generous to a primary school system which had none of Look, this. I encourage you strongly to after we're done recording, go to code.org. And I want you to do the first three lessons. Okay, I've programmed in Swift before. How about you come over to here, I'll take you to the primary school. And then you can say to me how this is in any way a code. You can get to code.org faster than I can come over to the elementary schools there. And I will come. But I want you to go ahead and try that code.org because you'll see that it is blocks being used to create code. And these are the foundations. I think the problem is, I said blocks, and you've taken it to mean blocks in some other context. This thing I was shown in a school was not coding, and it was being sold to the staff as if it was. So this is all a lot of hype in the UK. And you compare that to what Apple is doing with the, Ash, the Swift and Swift playgrounds. That's real. That's good, and I like that. I don't actually think everybody has to know how to code, but I think the more you know of it, the more you understand certain other things. And also the thinking process is terribly useful. Critical thinking is so useful in so many things. But I object to when it is hype for the sense of just ticking the odd box to say you've done something when you haven't. So great, good on Apple. Whoever provided this to this primary school, not so much. I think you need to go ahead and check out code.org. I think you're making a mistake. Yes, it's not the same as typing in the syntax in Swift, but it is teaching these thought processes about order of operations and, and repeating things. And there's actually a great app that teaches this kind of stuff. So there's a game called Human Resource Machine. And Human Resource Machine requires you to use different operations to get uh, boxes with numbers on them in the right order so that you can take them off the incoming conveyor belt and put them on the outgoing conveyor belt. And it gets progressively harder. And that is also teaching a programming thought process. Now, it's not saying subroutines and it's not doing all this kind of stuff, but it is it is teaching. It is learning. It just reminds me of now, I Love Lucy and the chocolate uh, factory line. But yep, okay. yep, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it, it kind of does. But give that one a shot too. So those are my are recommendations you homework today here for me. I am, and it is for you, and you are to do okay. it. Okay, um, should warn you in advance. Uh, I'm going to get a dog which might eat the homework, but as long as you know, no, nope. yeah. no, nope. code.org and human resource machine. Check it out. Now, half of Apple's U.S. hires in 2018, their new hires, lacked four-year college degrees. This is interesting because in in the past. The way that it was always put was there's a college for everyone, there's a university for everyone, and everyone should go and get that degree. And that if you can't get that degree, then you know you might not get a job. But the guarantee was that if you got a college degree, if you got a university degree, you would get a job. That sort of guarantee has gone away in the past decade or so, uh, maybe even longer. And it's really interesting that Apple is is publicly saying that half of their U.S. employment last year were people that did not have a four-year degree, and they're very proud of that. Is there any kind of breakdown of roles? I mean, how many are in Apple Store retail? So forward facing, how many are management? All this stuff. There's not that breakdown. Okay. I don't have that breakdown. But I can't find the answer to that on HomePod. Sorry about that. Okay. Now, th those employees range from sales specialists, managers, genius bar staff. Um, because genius bar staff, anything in the retail side is more likely to have a higher turnover is not, yeah, than yeah. Uh, other ones. But but also at headquarters, right? right? I mean, there there are plenty of ways to learn skills for programming that aren't required to be a four-year degree. Sure. You know, things like Lambda School, for example. Right. There, there, there are a lot of interesting things going on. Right. I don't know what that is. You should look that one up. You want more homework? You'll look that up too. Okay. I'm making a note right now. Can you tell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so yes all right well but this is good 
isn't it? I mean, well, we have an issue here in the UK that it's not that long since uh, higher education university levels were free, that we had a grant for it. Now we absolutely do not. We have to pay everything. Like Scotland is different. Scotland still uh, supports its students. So that is changing the type of courses that people go for. And honestly, it sometimes surprises me that there's quite a lot of... Um, uh, there are a lot of very successful university courses in writing and uh, writing is kind of half vocational, half not. The chances of getting a job after a writing degree are higher than after, I imagine, some of the more esoteric ones, but not as high as, say, an engineering one or things. I think the whole model yeah. of university to work, it used to be, at least here, that the fact that you've got a degree at all had taught you certain things and those things that taught you made you, you know, good in the workplace. If it also happened that you followed your actual subject, then so much the better. Now it seems here to be primarily vocationally driven. And I think that's reducing the number of times people are going to university at all. It sounds like it's the same in the States, but it's kind of working out. Is that fair? Yeah, uh, not entirely certain, but yeah. Okay. Well, fingers crossed. Okay. Now we talked in the past about San Diego, right? Uh, it's a fine, fine place. I'm sure I've driven through it. Uh, I think they have a... Qualcomm's based there. Okay, well, there you go. Qualcomm. What's not from you like? may have heard of. Yes. A bit busy these days, well, I understand. Yeah. Keeping that in your mind, mm -hmm. Apple promised to hire 1,200 new tech jobs in San Diego by the year 2022. All right. Yes. Some hires coming the end of 2019, but... 1,200 more jobs coming to San Diego. You get to, Interesting, huh? You're going to tell me that Qualcomm employs that exact number of people in that area. Nope, I'm not telling you anything. Oh, I'm going to let you draw your own conclusions. Okay, right. Draw your own conclusions. Well, William, this this has been wonderful. You've got homework to do, and, and I've got an episode to produce, and I'm so glad that we had all of our listeners here to join us for it. Cool. Well, remember to test me. Next week, I'll be absolutely ready for you. Okay. Right. Thank you for having this nice talk to you. <laughs> and uh, I'm really interested in all the health stuff. That I'm really going to go think about that. That's grand. All right. We'll be back next week. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm V Marks on Twitter. You're W Gallagher on Twitter. And where else can people find you? Uh, my favorite way, actually, is email uh, william at appleinsider.com. That gets straight through to me, and I just really enjoy getting emails that way. So. Fantastic. We'll be back next week.